So we were discussing the delta S x squared. Now, it was obvious from the general theorem that I have mentioned that in the S x basis, <coughs> that is its own eigenvector basis, it is zero. What about the z basis then? How to approach? There are several ways of approaching. The probably due to the dimensionality of the space being very low, two-dimensional only, the matrix representation is more suitable to use. What do I mean? I mean the following. In the SC basis, I write it in plain English as such, what is the matrix form of the SX? Zero. Of course, these number, physical numbers are important. It is this expression, right? That's what we have obtained in the SC basis. For example, what would be the form of SX in its own basis? One and one diagonal, right? One minus one, h power over two minus h power over two. This is in this basis. Therefore, it's more convenient to write it in that basis. How do I do that? Sx squared is <coughs> sorry. What is it? Let me write Sx squared. H power over four one zero zero one. I hate to write it equal. It's the matrix representation because it depends on the basis you are using. Therefore, to write it as equal is wrong because all these things are true in this basis only and its matrix will be different in a different basis. So you don't write it equal to that matrix. It, it, it is the corresponding matrix in that basis. So h bar squared over 4, identity. So whatever is the basis you are using, it wouldn't matter, but the Sx squared in the z basis will be h bar squared over 4 identity, which is 1 h bar squared over 4. So as far as the square is concerned, being proportional to the identity operator is really a trivial matter. It, it is the Sx which would make the difference, right? It is that one. So what is Sx? <clears throat> okay. I haven't introduced that notation and I feel a bit sorry that I have to introduce a new notation now. And uh, how do we get the expectation values in the matrix, matrix, matrix notation? Mm. Anyway, so this will be in the matrix notation, there is an h bar over 2. And there is this matrix in here. And what is the, we are computing it in the z basis, right? What are the z basis, uh, z bases in the matrix notation? In this one zero and zero one, okay. What is this? One zero, one zero. But this is the one one element, right? So there are several elements that I have to write it. So zero one, zero one. So this is 
zero, 1. So 1, zero, zero, 1 is 0. So what about the other one? That is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. This becomes now 1, 0, 0, 1. It's 0 again. So in the plus, plus z basis, obviously, sx is 0. Therefore, the uncertain, the dispersion is I will get into that actual notation when we discuss the spin in detail. I don't want to borrow too much from the future, but you see that in the z basis, the sx is expectation value 0. Therefore, delta sx squared expectation value z basis is, the first term is just this, h bar squared over 4, minus 0 coming from the sx, because if sx is 0, sx squared is 0, as h bar squared over 4. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but so what is the lesson we obtain? When we compute this expression in the x, it's own eigenvector basis, it is 0 in agreement with the general theorem we have proven, but if you use a different basis, you get different values, okay? Because this new basis is an eigenvector of a basis which doesn't commute with the original itself, okay? So you go to a different basis, which is associated with a different operator which is incompatible with the operator you are considering. Anyway, so let me now uh, state the theorem in its, more, in its generality and then we'll prove it in step by step. Heisenberg uncertainty theorem. A, B are incompatible. So then delta A squared expectation value, delta b squared <coughs> expectation value, the dispersion of the a times the dispersion of the b is larger or equal to a quarter expectation value of the a b commutator expectation value mod squared. That's the statement. That's the statement of the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship. Let's, uh, before uh, proceeding to prepare the setting for the ultimate proof of this theorem, let me illustrate this on a well-known example. If A is X and B is PX, <coughs> the usual moment, position and momentum operator. Again, we are borrowing from the feature because I, I will really move into the uh, discussion of these operators next week, soon, when we move into dynamics, really. Till now, we have been doing the mathematical formulation of the quantum mechanics. We'll move into dynamics by f moving into that field. So what is the commutation relations of A and B? Well, skip that. X, P, X, it is I, H, Y, right? So, how would the uncertainty relationship would read for this pair? Delta x squared expectation value, delta p. You see how cumbersome this new notation is. I will introduce a shorthand soon. It will be equal or larger 1 over 4 times ih bar. This is, of course, times an identity. When there's a number, and there's nothing you have to remember that it's the identity operator. IH bar, expectation value is IH bar, identity operator, expectation value is 1. So I, if that's mod square, I squared is 1. So it is IH 
bar squared, which is h bar squared over 4. So usually the shorthand for expressing this relationship, probably that's what you are more familiar with, is to write it as such. That is, delta x squared expectation value is symbolically written as delta x squared. Then I drop the, take the square root of both sides. Delta px is equal or larger than h bar over 2. <coughs> that is the one that you have seen years back, perhaps even at the freshman level. And this is the more general, in the more general language, which we will prove soon. Of course, when you talk about such relationship for predictions for the ground state energies for harmonic oscillator, hydrogen atom, bore, bore atom, for instance, you, you, have, you can use it, really. Oh, in that case, you have to think of the minimum uncertainty product, which is h bar over 2. Sometimes one uh, loosely used the h bar or h, or, but actually, if, we, if you want to really use it rigorously, you have to define the interval. But if it is full, minus infinity, plus infinity interval, or a finite half lines or whatever, then of course it makes a lot of difference. But the minimum should be h bar over 2 because that is the, that's what follows from the general theorem. So let's now proceed uh, to prepare ourselves towards the proof of that. Uh, the first theorem we have to use as a lemma, as a preparation, is the Schwarz inequality. I will write the inequality and <coughs> demonstrate this. <coughs> then. We will use it. What is the Schwarz inequality? It reads as follows. If you have uh, two cats, alpha and beta, consider cats alpha and beta, then you can prove the following. Alpha, alpha, that is the length square of this cat in the vector space, times beta, beta, is equal or larger than alpha, beta, inner product squared, mod squared. You need the mod square because you know that these inner products in the cat space are complex numbers. Therefore, this is being the norm of the alpha cat, being the norm of beta cat. Obviously, they are real, right? Because <coughs> alpha beta is equal to beta alpha. Complex conjugate, you replace the beta with the alpha. Alpha alpha is equal to alpha alpha. Complex conjugate, it's real. If it is real, this is real, obviously. When you are having a left-hand side, a real product, you, have to, you can only compare it meaningfully with a real number, obviously. It's only natural to see that it is the mod square of it coming out. So it's not something redundant, something which is cooked up. Everything is tied together very, very tightly. Before proceeding to prove this nice theorem, probably you have seen it at the level of linear algebra, at the freshman level perhaps, or even calculus, what is the an analog of this in the uh, three-dimensional Euclidean space? 3D Euclidean space, we have, for instance, the A and B are three Euclidean vectors, and the inner product of it is obviously defined as the magnitude of the one vector, the magnitude of the other times the cosine of the angle between them. Perhaps to be really careful, you can say it is theta is the angle between these two vectors. And when you take the square of it, And then you remember that cosine squared theta is a number which is always less than or equal to 1. It is 1 when theta is equal to 0 or pi or 2 pi, this, this square. Then 
the right hand side of this is less than a squared times b squared, right? Because if this is less than one, then this entire thing is less than a squared times b squared. If you take the mod square of it, not square root of it, you may say this is less than a and b. This is something you are already familiar. That's the, the, the inner product. It has a sign, therefore, so I take the more, more of it, is less than the product of the magnitudes of the two vectors. So you see how similar these things are. Either, either in the square form or in the square root of form, doesn't matter. Right? The, the mod squares are larger or equal of the inner product squared. Inner product squared. <coughs> so the analogy was <coughs> gave us a plausibility argument that meaning that something we are what we are doing is something meaningful and understandable. So let's proceed to demonstrate it. So for the demonstration, let me consider proof of the shorts. Proof of Schwartz inequality. Consider now a superposition of these two cats that I have started with. Consider a new cat defined as a linear superposition of the original two cats with an arbitrary complex number. As we are in the complex spaces, there's room for the complex number. So it's natural that lambda is a complex number. What was the basic postulates of the inner products? Inner products, one of the first postulates was that this would be positive definite. Remember when we have introduced inner product, this was listed as the, the first postulate. And there was a second postulate saying that alpha beta is a complex conjugate of the beta alpha. So these two was sufficient for us to construct everything about the inner product. So if so, I have to substitute those things in. Alpha plus lambda star, because we are going to the bra, cat to bra space. Lambda is a complex number. It becomes lambda. Conjugate times alpha plus lambda beta should be equal or larger. Let me give this a name. Notice that as these gammas are defined in terms of this complex parameter, if I put the lambda in here, and I can give this a name really as a shorthand f of lambda, lambda complex, it's lambda and lambda star, actually. So let me expand this. f is alpha alpha plus lambda squared beta beta. Notice that at this level, I haven't really assumed that alphas or betas are normalized. They are arbitrary cats. Huh? But that perhaps I can here put arbitrary saying that they don't have to be really normalized. <coughs> then, plus lambda alpha beta plus lambda star beta alpha is the f. Well, that's of course due to the basic postulate of the inner product, that's positive. So what I want is very lambda and see whether I can minimize this expression in terms of the lambda. What is the minimum that I can get for f? F find the minimum of f. How do I do that? I consider the f, the lambda, is equal to 0. 
being complex, it's not sufficient, of course. The FD lambda star. Actually, extremum. And I'll discover that it's really minimum. But in principle, if I look at these two conditions first, it can only produce an extremum. To have a minimum, the second derivative should be positive. If it was maximum, second derivative would be minimum, negative. So let's take these derivatives first, and then let's worry about the signs a little after. It's so what do I get when I vary this f with respect to the lambda? Here is the expression. The f, the lambda <laughs> is lambda star beta beta from this term and plus alpha beta is equal to zero. This I can use to solve for lambda star minus alpha beta divided by beta and beta. And let me take the df d lambda star is lambda beta beta plus beta alpha is zero. Lambda is minus beta alpha divided by beta beta. Well, it didn't reproduce, it didn't produce anything new, the second one. It's the same as the first, because you, when you take the complex conjugate of the first relationship, you get the second one. That's nice. This is really an extremum point. Is it really maximum or minimum? Let me check the second derivative. Second derivative will be second derivative with respect to lambda, second derivative with respect to lambda star, or second derivative with respect to lambda, lambda star mixed. As there are C numbers, just to get the mixed from this with respect to star or from this with respect to lambda is sufficient. So let me get d squared f d lambda, d lambda star from the first one. It is beta and beta, and that's positive. And you check the other signs. That's indeterminate, so it, this, is, this is sufficient. There is no need for checking lambda squared or lambda star squared. This tells you that it is a minimum. Well, actually, it could be a saddle point, but a minimum here, obviously. This is due to the first postulate of the inner product. It's positive definite. So if I substitute this value now in f, I will get the f minimum. I can comfortably write it as minimum alpha and alpha plus lambda lambda star is plus alpha beta squared divided by beta beta squared times beta beta that is from the second term, and the third and fourth term gives you what? Third term gives you minus alpha beta squared divided by beta beta. <coughs> and the fourth term as well gives you the same, so it's twice. And that cancels against that. So finally, we have that nice expression, alpha and alpha minus alpha beta squared divided by beta beta. That's the minimum value of the f. You cannot go below it. What we have done again, let me repeat, we had two arbitrary cats, alpha and beta, and we considered the linear superposition of it by introducing an arbitrary complex number and change the value of it and we have seen what is the value, the minimum that this new vector, the length of this new vector couldn't be less than this. And this is positive definite, right? And that's the lowest value <coughs> you get. You come from the positive side, approach towards this value, 
And that's it, you stop at that point. That's the length of the gamma. So this gives you what you take to the, this to the right hand side, alpha, alpha, is larger than that, or move this, multiply it with the positive number, because these are both alpha, alpha, and beta, beta, lengths of alpha, and lengths of beta are positive, therefore you are allowed to write both sides with these positive numbers, and then you get alpha, alpha, times beta, beta, is equal or larger than alpha, beta, squared. This is the promised proof of the Schwarz lemma that we have written there, right? This was the expression here, and that is what we have obtained that demonstrated it indeed so. Before proceeding any further, it is worthwhile commenting on the equality sign. When does the equality sign hold? Let's discuss that briefly and let's set it aside to be picked up later at the end of the hour. Then we will proceed. What is it? When does the equality sign hold? Well, in order to understand it, let's go to the well-known familiar example in the three-dimensional Euclidean space in here. When is this a dot b squared is equal to a squared times b squared? When this cosine squared theta is 1. Theta is 0 or pi. When that's parallel or anti-parallel, but when we are looking at the mode, uh, the real number, positive numbers, so if a is parallel to b in the Euclidean space, in three-dimensional Euclidean space, a squared b squared is equal to a dot b squared when a is parallel to b. Or simply, if you can write b as a c times a, a number, then it, is it really so? When you write this as, this is real vector space, so this real number, a squared times a squared, <coughs> and this is a squared squared times c squared. Indeed, so that's a good lesson that to remember, to carry over to this cat space, which is a linear vector space. So we say, based on this lesson, Based on this lesson, we say equality holds for the general Schwartz. Equality holds when beta is equal to c times alpha, for instance. This is the definition of parallelism in the cat space, right? When these uh, two uh, cats are proportional and the factor is an arbitrary complex number, Let's substitute this in the Schwarz inequality and show that it indeed gives you the equality. So what is alpha alpha is alpha alpha, beta beta is c mod squared, because that's a complex number now, we are in the complex vector space. So left hand side of the Schwarz inequality is c mod squared times alpha alpha squared. What is the right-hand side of the Schwarz inequality? Right-hand side is, there's a mod squared. Alpha, beta is c times alpha squared. c mod squared comes out, and you have alpha and alpha squared. Obviously, you don't need that mod squared anymore in this case, because alpha, alpha is positive definite, according to the first axiom of our postulate of the inner product. So it is c mod squared alpha, alpha squared again. So they are the same. So if the two cats are parallel, that is, if one of them is an arbitrary complex number times the other one, the first one, 
so you get equality. Let's keep that at the back of our mind when we get to the end of it and if when we ask the question what are the minimum uncertainty product states that will be relevant for that. There are examples of it, right? For example, in the harmonic isolation <coughs> case, coherent states are minimum uncertainty product states and they have very fundamental applications in quantum optics. So these minimum uncertainty products are important concepts, therefore it would be nice to pick them up later. Let me proceed now. <coughs> we have this theorem proven, so how are we going to use this theorem to ultimately reach the, un the uncertainty product, the uncertainty theorem that we have stated? For that, what we do is the following. <coughs> Let me introduce <laughs> Okay, let me introduce the following. Oh, by the way, I don't want to spend too much time with some uh, observations, but there are several observations before uh, we, we really state the theorem and prove it. Expectation value of a Hermitian operator is purely real. Observations. That's more or less obvious, but let me demonstrate. One, expectation value of a Hermitian operator is purely real. Herm operator is real. I write in plain English. It's a funny language, but that's really very explanatory. How do we prove this? The proof of it goes with the following, the proof, demonstration, or whatever. What is the definition of Hermitian conjugate? The Hermitian conjugate was defined in arbitrary state cats as follows, beta x alpha star. That's what we have done demonstrated before. That was the definition of Hermitian conjugate. If x is Hermitian, then you have alpha x beta is equal to beta x alpha. That's a general expression. To get the expectation value, you set beta equals alpha. Alpha x alpha is equal to alpha x alpha star. That's the proof. It's equal to complex conjugate of itself. So expectation value of a Hermitian operator is real in an arbitrary cat. That's the first observation. A second, expectation value of anti-Hermitian is purely imaginary. Observation <coughs> two, expectation value of anti-Hermitian operator here is purely imaginary. That is i times a real number, right? That's the meaning of purely imaginary. How do I demonstrate? What is the anti-Hermitian operator? C anti-Hermitian meaning that C dagger is minus the C. When its sign is plus, it's Hermitian. When the sign is minus, it's a definition of anti-Hermitian. Okay, so again, Hermitian conjugation was using that same expression, x dagger beta is beta x alpha star. That's the definition of Hermitian conjugation. Now this time it is, when you replace x with c and write the c dagger as minus c, that's the c. And then convert this into an expectation value by writing alpha beta to be the same. Minus alpha C alpha is equal to alpha C alpha star. A complex number is equal to minus of itself. If you write complex number Z as 
x plus i y. So this left hand side is minus x plus i y. Right hand side is x minus i y. Notice that i y is go away. X then you get the result x equals zero, meaning z is i times y. It's simple, very simple proof, really. So that demonstrates my claim. They're saying that anti-Hermitian expectation value of anti-Hermitian operator is purely imaginary. That sets the stage so I can proceed now. Let me define. I won't be able to finish this theorem today, but doesn't matter. We'll continue next week because it's such an important theorem. Let me make the maximum, let me get the maximum out of this remaining 10 minutes. I define now alpha Define. Alpha is delta A gamma. This way I introduce a gamma state. Okay. Okay. What is the what is the DA then? It requires that I need to define this. DA is defined now as square root of The square root of of I don't like this notation. Delta A squared is sorry. The A is defined as before. Sorry, I stick to Sakurai definition. Let me not play with the definitions. This, this is the definition we have started with, so let's proceed with this. And beta cat is defined as db gamma. So we really have a basic arbitrary cat gamma, and from that gamma we generate alpha and beta by applying on it by this delta d a and delta a and delta b. Okay. So what is the length square of this alpha cat? Alpha alpha is I'm using a sort of pedantic notation. Let me write it as such and for the B I will not be that careful. What is the D A dagger? It is A dagger minus the expectation by return identity, identity dagger is one. This is a real number. A dagger is equal to A. So delta A and delta B are Hermitian. These are Hermitian, immediately checked. So although I started with writing it as delta A dagger, I know that it's delta A. So this is gamma A, delta A squared, and gamma. So what is the alpha alpha? Alpha alpha turned out to be delta A squared expectation value in the gamma cat. So it is the dispersion of the A in the gamma cat. That's what I had alpha alpha. Similarly, beta beta will be, similarly, I'm not repeating the intermediate, now it's clear. It is gamma D b squared gamma or expectation value of d b squared gamma. How nice. So there is a specific role attributed to the gamma, right? Obviously, because it enters in a fundamental way. So let me write now the Schwarz inequality. The Schwarz inequality becomes Schwarz inequality becomes Delta A squared in the gamma state times delta B squared in the gamma state is equal or larger than the inner product of alpha and beta. What is it? How do I get the alpha beta inner product? These are Hermitian, therefore it turns 
and it becomes dA, dB, gamma, expectation value magnitude. Correct? I'm just reading the right-hand side and squared. Sorry, there's a squared. That's the Schwarz inequality. Okay, so let me proceed. <clears throat> now comes a nice trick. This is delta A, delta B, expectation value in the gamma. Let me write this delta A, delta B product <coughs> as commutator divided by half plus anti-commutator plus half. In the anti-commutator, I have a minus of the opposite order. In the commutator, I have a plus of the opposite order. They cancel, the first term add up, and that's a trivial identity, right? Delta A, delta B. But the commutator can be simply computed. It is, remember, A minus the expectation value. It's operator minus C a number times identity. It is really directly, and half a minute exercise show that it's the commutator, really. Because the second term is identity, it commutes with any operator, so they drop as far as commutators are concerned. So this is really one half of the A commutator with B, one half anti-commutator. One thing clear, however, this is anti-hermitian. The commutator of two hermitian operators are anti-hermitian because you change the order. When you take the dagger and then take the dagger, daggers are equal to itself, there's an overall minus sign. The second, as the relative sign between the two terms is plus, it's Hermitian. It's Hermitian. So it's a general rule that the product of two Hermitian operators, well, it's a little more general than that, but here for the specific example I'm considering, the product of two Hermitian operators can be written as the sum of a Hermitian plus an anti-Hermitian operator. That's a very nice thing to really have. So what is the <coughs> expectation value of the first term? Expectation value would be purely imaginary. Expectation value because that's the expectation value that I have to take, right? Regardless of the specific nature of the gamma, the expectation value of the second term will be purely real. Nice. So when you have this when you have the expectation value of this, it will be a real number plus an imaginary number, real number one plus i times real number two. Real number one comes from the anti-Hermitian part when you take the expectation value, and the real number two comes from the expectation value of the anti-Hermitian, the commutator part. Anti-Hermitian means I times, uh, uh, it's purely imaginary meaning I times a real number, right? When you take the square of this, it's going to be real number one squared, plus the real number 2 squared. 
because it is a complex number in principle, a1 plus i times b1, and you take the mod square of it is a1 squared plus b1 squared. So what is the first term then? The first term then is the expectation value of this with the mod squared. Let me write it to the left. I will write underneath and I have no time left for this. So it's going to be 1 over 4 a b commutator squared because the inside is expectation values are a pure, comp pure imaginary. If there is a mod squared so i is killed by that. 1 over 4 that plus 1 over 4 mod expectation value dA dB expectation value squared. So that's really the end of the story as far as we are concerned. What is the <coughs> left, left hand side? This is the left hand side and that portion is the right hand side. Here. Let me write underneath perhaps here and then we stop for today. So what I have found in here is the following. 1 over 4 a b expectation value squared plus quarter expectation value d a d b. Here it's important. d a d b expectation value squared. So that's sufficient for today. We have indeed found the delta a squared times delta b squared expectation values. They are their dispersions. Here bracket is missing. Is equal or larger than this. We'll elaborate further, but notice that that is a positive number, right? The second term. Something mod squared. If we drop it, the inequality becomes stronger. So it becomes larger than a quarter mod squared expectation. That is really the expression of the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship. This is a more general version. Heisenberg's is a stronger one because you drop something positive further and to reduce the value of the right hand side further by dropping the second term. You drop the second term and you lower the value so your inequality becomes stronger. How do we get equality sign under what case and how do we construct that particular minimum uncertainty product case in the case when the <coughs> the alpha and beta as I defined, alpha and beta are parallel to each other. So next time I will write the parallelity of beta and alpha by writing beta is equal to c times alpha and solve that equation to determine the gammas. We see that they are going to be Gaussian states which satisfy the minimum uncertainty condition, but that's we are uh, fortunately, okay, we were lucky to finish the theorem today and we can elaborate further on it next time, next week. That's it today.